So um, welcome back. This is uh, Joe Becker, again, from Stanford uh, University School of Medicine. Um, and we're talking about acute stroke. Uh, and we've already kind of gone through a little bit of our interaction and work up with the patient, and we're going to continue now. So just to review, as you recall, we have a 62-year-old male who's brought in by his family members after one hour of them noting him to be in bed, unable to speak clearly or coherently. And he's also noted to not be moving his right side. All right. Um, we uh, initially uh, assessed this patient, found the ABCs to be intact. In other words, his airway, breathing, and circulation were intact. Um, we also found that the patient was found by his family members, so we're not sure when this started. Um, we assessed the patient's vital signs. We found that he was hypertensive, but otherwise the vital signs were relatively uh, within normal limits. We acted to check a finger stick blood sugar, to establish an IV, and to place this patient on a cardiac monitor. In this patient, we considered a differential diagnosis, and that's a very important part, as we discussed, of our interaction with the patient. We considered neurologic as well as non-neurologic uh, mimics of stroke, and in this case, we have a list here that we discussed of the uh, non-neurologic mimics of stroke syndromes and stroke symptoms, um, some of the most important being the low blood sugar, which uh, frequently can manifest with focal uh, neurologic findings, as well as infection, both central nervous system infections, such as meningitis, encephalitis, or, or brain abscess, or more systemic infections like sepsis. These can all produce neurologic findings. We also discussed the different types of stroke, uh, hemorrhagic stroke in which there is a bleeding aneurysm or blood vessel in the brain, or ischemic stroke in which a blood vessel has been blocked likely by cardio, uh, likely by atherosclerotic disease in which blood flow to a segment of the brain has been interrupted. We discussed in emergency medicine our approach to the patient in which we begin with an initial evaluation and assessment of the patient which includes a sample history and a focused physical examination. We discussed how uh, the approach to patients in emergency medicine is more triangular and that sometimes after this focused assessment is important to immediately think about the patient, consider their presentation to develop a differential diagnosis, or sometimes it's important to act, as in this case, to perform diagnostic testing, uh, such as the finger stick blood sugar or other diagnostic tests and um, uh, other more definitive treatments. So as we move along and we're considered the patient, developed a differential diagnosis, we've initially acted. Uh, it's important to consider a diagnostic test in patients with, who present with focal neurologic findings. And this is a short list of potential diagnostic tests that might be helpful in this, in this setting. So we see CBC, there's a complete blood count, serum electrolytes, uh, urinalysis, uh, lipase, and pancreatic enzyme, electrocardiogram, plain x-rays of the chest or perhaps uh, the skull, ultrasound, uh, CT scan, lumbar puncture or spinal tap, or a coagulation panel. And these are all important uh, considerations as we work up patients with acute neurologic findings. In this case, uh, the checked boxes here will be particularly of particular importance. So the complete blood count will be important for us to determine if this patient is severely anemic. That can give us an indication if the patient has different types of infection or other kinds of medical, um, medical diagnoses that perhaps could contribute to the uh, altered uh, neurologic findings that we have on, in this patient. As well, as previously discussed, it'll be very important to check serum electrolytes in this patient. Sodium levels in particular are very important in patients with altered levels of consciousness, seizure, or neurologic findings, as both low sodium and high sodium can produce these symptoms. Uh, urinalysis will be oftentimes important because a patient with an infection, even of the uh, urinary tract, can frequently manifest with depressed level of consciousness, confusion, um, and neurologic signs. It will be important to obtain an electrocardiogram in this patient, and that is uh, true because many patients with stroke or uh, ischemic and hemorrhagic will manifest cardiac arrhythmia and instability, and so it will be important to assess that in this patient. Of critical importance in this patient is a CAT scan or a CT scan computed tomography. And this will be discussed in a moment, but it will be very important for us to determine and differentiate between hemorrhagic stroke and ischemic stroke. You'll note that lumbar puncture is not checked in this patient, and this is an important uh, discussion. Uh, 
Now, lumbar puncture can be a very important and useful diagnostic test when we're trying to determine the etiology of a patient's neurologic findings. So in other words, if a patient has confusion or perhaps a patient has seizure or depressed level of consciousness, lumbar puncture can inform this differential diagnosis and determine and help us determine if this patient has an infectious condition. In this patient, it may not be as helpful, at least initially. And the reason for that is the patient does not seem to have an infection. There is no fever. Um, certainly, we have not gotten a history from the family of fever uh, either, nor does the patient seem to have any findings that would be consistent with an infectious process, particularly of the brain. We sometimes discuss nuchal rigidity, patients with a stiff neck um, or severe headache. Oftentimes, this can be a component of a patient's presentation when they have meningitis or other cerebral infection, and this does not seem to be the case with our patient. So certainly this is a consideration, but at least in the initial assessment of the patient, not something that we would probably reach for immediately. Um, it would be very important and helpful to check a coagulation panel in this patient if that was uh, available to you. And that is important because if this patient is having a hemorrhagic stroke, it'll be important to find out if they are hemorrhaging because of a particular defect in their coagulation, or perhaps this patient is uh, unknown to family members but is taking a blood thinner that is making their, um, their level of uh, coagulation impaired. As we've discussed, a very important uh, message here is that a rapid blood sugar test should be performed immediately in all patients with neurologic findings, seizure, and, all, and or altered mental state. This is a very easily fixed, uh, very easily identified medical diagnosis uh, that can be dangerous and if left to persist can be life-threatening uh, and can result in significant disability. So it's always going to be very important to check a rapid blood sugar test in any patient that initially presents to you with seizure, altered mental state, or confusion, or any kind of neurologic findings. So we have obtained our, we've determined which diagnostic test we want to obtain first, and the results are here. Uh, our rapid blood sugar test is normal at 110 milligrams per deciliter. We've also obtained a complete blood count, which reveals a normal hematocrit of 36 and a normal platelet count of 185,000. The ECG is as well normal and shows normal sinus rhythm and is non-ischemic. A urinalysis reveals no evidence of an infection. The coagulation panel is normal, and this does not, indicate, does not indicate the patient has any proclivity to bleed. We've also obtained electrolytes revealing a normal sodium level. So, so far, pretty good, and there's no real explanation thus far for this patient's altered level of uh, altered neurologic function. All right, so now the CT scan. We've discussed uh, the CT scan a little bit, and uh, one of the reasons why we might get this. Essentially, a CAT scan is useful in the patient presenting with acute neurologic findings only insofar as we can, deter we can differentiate hemorrhagic stroke from ischemic stroke. And the way we do that is by looking for evidence of hemorrhage. Hemorrhage on a CT, or at least acute hemorrhage, is often seen. The sensitivity of CAT scan for cerebral hemorrhage varies, but many times in the acute presentation, we will see evidence of hemorrhage, and that will help us to make the diagnosis. This is not so much the case with ischemic stroke. Most ischemic strokes that are acute will not manifest with findings on a CT scan. As such, we will not be able to determine uh, with, to any great degree of certainty based on a CAT scan that the patient has an ischemic stroke. We can just use the CT scan to argue against the presence of hemorrhagic stroke. In the case of our patient, there is no evidence of hemorrhage and there is no evidence of any acute abnormality. We discussed before on our differential diagnosis that brain infections or even brain cancer, such as a brain tumor, could potentially cause focal neurologic findings that would present as our patient has. We don't see any evidence of that on the CAT scan. So that it helps us to some degree to narrow our differential diagnosis. So at this point, we want to think and put it all together. We've obtained our diagnostic tests. We've performed our assessment of the patients. We've intervened in some ways, starting an IV, placing the patient on a cardiac monitor, and we have also uh, checked their finger stick blood sugar. We've noted, we've developed a differential diagnosis, and we've narrowed that diagnosis with the di diagnostic tests that we've obtained. So as we are doing this, as we are thinking about our patient and incorporating our diagnostic testing into our approach to this patient, we get an update from the nurse. The nurse calls you to alert you to the fact that the patient has deteriorated. There's apparently a declining level of consciousness and the patient's respirations are labored and there is a gurgling noise associated with these respirations.
As we are considering uh, the diagnostic tests we've obtained and we're incorporating these the results of these testing tests into our thinking about our patient, the nurse calls you to alert you to the fact that it, the, our patient has deteriorated. Uh, the patient seems to have declining level of consciousness and respirations are gurgling and labored. Um, now this can be uh, very much anxiety provoking. It seems as though our patient is not doing well and as we return to the bedside to assess the patient, it's important to consider the approach of emergency medicine and what we do. As we initially discuss this, when a patient comes in the door, we evaluate them, we think or we act based on their presentation. And then oftentimes based on changes in the patient's clinical condition, we must reevaluate and reperform the patient care cycle in emergency medicine to either think again about their situation or to immediately act. Um, and in this case, uh, it is important for us to reassess our patient based on the new findings that the nurse has provided us with and determine what the best uh, intervention is at this point. So we start back at the beginning. We perform our ABCs. The patient has changed. The patient was previously alert. Now they're unresponsive. We note sonorous or somewhat snoring breath sounds and shallow breathing. The patient, as you are assessing them, begins to vomit, which certainly as well can contribute to declining uh, airway function, or, I'm sorry, airway patency in this patient. We also obtained a new set of vital signs, which is, reveals a blood pressure of 165 over 70, fairly similar to the set of vital so the hypertension that we noted earlier. The pulse is 86 and regular and still similar to what it had been previously. The respiratory rate's a little higher. The patient seems to be a little more tachypnic, and the rate is 28. The patient is still afebrile with a temperature of 36.4. The most notable change is that the patient now seems to be becoming hypoxic. In other words, their oxygenation on room air is now only 88%, and this is a very concerning finding. As we saw in the beginning of our patient interaction, we considered a list of immediate interventions or things that we could um, perform to initially stabilize a patient or perhaps save their life. Um, and we consider that list again as this patient's condition has changed. In this case, we've noted that the patient is vomiting. So it'll be very important to position our patient uh, onto his left side such that he is not allowed to lay on his back, continue to vomit, and thus potentially aspirate vomitus, blocking his airway. This will be important, very important step, and turning the patient on the left side in this case may uh, be life-saving. Um, furthermore, it'll be very important to open the patient's airway uh, it was noted that the patient had sonorous breath sounds. In other words, um, seemed to be somewhat snoring uh, when they were first assessed. And this can indicate that the tongue or perhaps other soft tissues in the hypopharynx are obstructing the passage of air in the airway. As such, performing a head tilt, jaw thrust uh, maneuver can oftentimes restore the airway and allow um, the patient to breathe uh, effectively if, in fact, they are breathing on their own. It will allow us as well to provide the next two interventions, the provision of oxygen as well as bag valve mask respirations um, to the patient to, uh, to assist in resuscitation. Um, we as well already have the patient on the cardiac monitor. They already have an IV, and many times it is helpful to reassess the blood glucose uh, if there is a change in a patient's level of consciousness or neurologic function. So now that we have our patient, we've stabilized them, we've also considered the diagnostic tests, we've seen our CT scan that does not show evidence of hemorrhage, and we have no, and we've managed to address uh, most of the non-neurologic causes for acute neurologic findings. What treatment can we provide our patient specific to his condition, which we suspect is ischemic stroke? Well, reperfusion therapy is something that is a very complex topic and also the subject of much, much controversy and much discussion. So we'll just touch on it briefly today just so that uh, we are aware of the therapies that are available in some settings for patients who do present with um, ischemic stroke. Now, the most discussed uh, therapy for reperfusion is a thrombolytic agent or TPA. And what this, these agents can do is they can, when administered intravenously, they can dissolve a clot and thus theoretically restore perfusion to a territory of the brain. Is this patient a, would this patient be a candidate for thrombolysis? Well, in this patient, there, thrombolysis has multiple contraindications, including timing. Most people believe that thrombolytics must be administered between either three or 4.5 hours 
after the patient's onset of symptoms. In this case, we just don't know how long the patient has had symptoms. They were discovered in this state by their family, and they are unable to tell us, particularly now that they seem to have decompensated, they're unable to tell us what is the explanation, when their symptoms uh, first began. Um, as such, this patient would not be a candidate for thrombolytics. Furthermore, there are multiple uh, contraindications to the administration of thrombolytic therapy, and these would need to be considered and discussed at length, both with the patient's family as well as perhaps with consulting services if we have them available. Um, aspirin, however, can be administered to patients who, are, who have been concluded not to have hemorrhagic stroke, and current guidelines suggest that this should be administered within the first 24 to 48 hours. Besides reperfusion therapy, what other therapeutic interventions can we undertake to, to help our patient and help to preserve as much of their neurologic function as possible? Well, this essentially boils down to how can we pre prevent further ischemia and cerebral necrosis from what is already likely to be an ischemic stroke? Any episode of hypoxia must be corrected. And you, we've noted that our patient, when they decompensated, the blood uh, pulse oxygenation seemed to decline to in the high 80s. This can be very, very serious and lead to a great worsening in the patient's condition and potential outcome. As such, we must be on hand very rapidly to, re to address problems with airway, breathing, as well as um, hypoxia, such that it may become necessary to administer supplemental oxygen. Furthermore, low blood pressure uh, may be a very, very bad uh, development in patients with ischemic stroke, and we must act to preserve perfusion of the patient's brain. Um, sometimes when patients become hypotensive, it's necessary to administer fluids, and for that we have established an IV in this patient. Uh, our patient has been somewhat hypertensive, and that oftentimes can be permitted. Uh, patients who are hypertensive in the setting of isch ischemic stroke are thought to be compensating for decreased cerebral perfusion as a result of the obstructive lesion. And as such, we do allow hypertension in these patients up to a degree. Um, and as such, uh, hypertension such as our own patients should not be treated uh, immediately. As we recall in the patient care cycle, we have a patient, we assess, evaluate, and think about them and act, and we may sometimes need to reevaluate them. The goal of the emergency medicine patient care cycle is to develop a disposition. In this case, we've considered and we believe that the patient is having an ischemic stroke. We've considered and discussed the CAT scan of the head, its role, and its results. We've discussed the role of the treatment that we can provide, including uh, thrombolytics as well as other uh, components of the patient's care that we can't intervene upon, such as level of hypoxia and level of blood pressure. We also had a decline in this patient's clinical state, which, allowed, which required us to intervene to provide oxygen as well as to preserve the airway. Uh, we, at this point, will, it'll become necessary to involve our specialists, our intensive care unit physicians, our neurology assistants, and in the case of hemorrhagic stroke, our neurosurgeons, if we have them available. Depending on our practice setting, it may be very important to transfer this patient to an appropriate level of care. Stroke patients are critically ill. Stroke patients may have multiple complications, including cardiorespiratory complications. They may have worsening of their neurologic function, and as such, should really be in a center that is able to provide close monitoring as well as advanced airway and respiratory support, as we've discussed. As such, most patients in a district hospital type setting with acute stroke should be transferred to a more centralized and uh, referral-based level of care that have the specialist resources on hand uh, that are uh, listed above. So at this point, we've taken the patient through from their presentation with their focal neurologic findings through our initial assessment, which included airway, breathing, and circulation, the ABCs, as well as a collection of the patient's vital signs. We've used these findings, as well as the sample history and physical examination, to develop a differential diagnosis. This differential diagnosis involved a list of non-neurologic explanations for the patient's presentation, such as low blood sugar or electrolyte abnormalities, as well as uh, stroke uh, differential diagnosis, including ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. We used our diagnostic studies to narrow this differential diagnosis 
for instance, we used our measurement of electrolytes, uh, measurements of the, of the chemistry panel, to determine the patient did not have an abnormal sodium level. We also measured the blood, patient's blood sugar, which was as well normal. A CAT scan of the head assisted us in, uh, in our determination the patient was not likely to be having a hemorrhagic stroke or other findings such as a brain tumor. Uh, Based on these diagnostic studies, we concluded that the patient was likely to be having an ischemic stroke. When the patient deteriorated, we intervened, providing assistance for the patient's airway and supporting their oxygenation. Uh, we also discussed disposition and the fact that most stroke patients are critically ill and will require very elevated levels of care, including ICU level of care with consultants uh, and neurologists and perhaps neurosurgeons in the case of hemorrhagic strokes. We also discussed the range of interventions that we can undertake for the patients and the importance of an initial assessment of the finger stick blood sugar or the rapid blood sugar to determine that the patient did not have a very early correctable hypoglycemia. Um, this concludes this discussion of the acute stroke patient. Thank you very much.